In order to successfully implement the integrated music teaching model in your studio, you'll need to acknowledge three key principles that we call our pillars. And they are, number one, a student-first or student-centered approach. Number two, multimodal assessment. And number three, questions build curiosity. So let's unpack each of those in turn. You're listening to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast from Top Music. Tune in weekly as we interview music teachers and experts from around the world to explore creative activities and ideas that build learning connections in students. Our integrated music teaching approach will deepen your students' understanding of musical concepts, engage them in critical thinking, improve their reading and performance, foster their curiosity, and prepare them for a lifetime of music making. Tim Topham here and welcome back to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast from Top Music Co. I hope you're having a great week and I hope you enjoyed last week's 300th episode with all our little shout outs from people around the world and some of those new big announcements. Uh, And it's been fantastic to hear all the feedback. I've been getting emails, we've had comments on social media uh, and it's just been great to firstly learn how excited a number of you are about this how it already aligns with many of the approaches that you're taking, how you want to learn more. It's all super cool. So this week, we're going to continue our look at integrated music teaching with an overview of our three pillars, which provide the foundation for successfully using this approach in your own teaching. And then what we'll do is next week, we'll walk you through the simple three-step integrated music teaching process, which will allow you to start implementing this in your own lessons. And then finally, in episode number 304, we're also going to share some audio and video of some of these creative integrations in action using live lesson excerpts that you can listen to on the podcast and also watch on video when you're back at your computer. As I also mentioned last week, we're working currently on creating our our Integrate Your Teaching Challenge, which is going to be coming up in November. So, if you'd like to jump on the wait list to find out more about that, then head over to topmusic.co slash challenge. All right, let's jump into it. So, last week, as I said, we announced the launch of our integrated music teaching model for helping teachers provide more connected, immersive experiences for their music students. So, today, we're going to explore the how-to by discussing the three pillars. In order to successfully implement the integrated music teaching model in your studio, you'll need to acknowledge three key principles that we call our pillars. And they are, number one, a student-first or student-centered approach. Number two, multimodal assessment. And number three, questions build curiosity. So let's unpack each of those in turn. So firstly, student first teaching. And I remember going to a lecture by Professor Gary McPherson, the head of the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music some years ago. And I wrote down this quote. And he said through his research that when students choose their own piece, there is an 11 fold increase in productivity. And we know this from our own teaching. I don't imagine there's many teachers around these days who force all their students to learn the same pieces of music each and every time. We always give them a choice. And I I think that has come back to us in increased motivation for students learning pieces. But allowing them to choose from a selection of repertoire pieces is only one way of giving students increased autonomy. I prefer to look at the bigger picture of why is the child or adult taking lessons? What is their goal and what would they most love to be able to do? These kinds of questions when considering how student-centered my approach can be. So, here's a simple question for you. What are the key learning outcomes of your music lessons? That is, what do you want students to be able to do when they finish, in inverted commas, lessons with you? Knowing the outcomes can determine how you teach, what you teach and how you assess, but also and only when it's blended with the student's own desires and goals. So, going back to that question, my prediction is that you'll say something like uh, that my student will have a love of music and that's fantastic. But let's go a little bit deeper. How are you going to achieve that? Uh, So, another desire might be to be able to play with technical fluency, any piece they want. That's a great outcome. To be able to sight read music that they want for a sing-along. To be able to play music for life or perhaps to show off their friends that they can play the latest pop song or to do a cool trumpet improv in the school jazz band. Here are some of the lists of goals that I think are crucial for students to be successful in a lifelong music making journey. They need to have a better understanding of the inner workings of music. Students need to understand the harmonic function of music, especially if they're guitarists and keyboard players. 
Students know why they're learning theory and how it's directly related to the performance and creation of music. And students can sight read better because they'll start noticing and understanding the harmony of music. These are the kind of interlink goals that I think are all wrapped up in having an approach that really takes the students' goals into consideration. The point is that while we have our own set of goals we feel is important for students to achieve, unless we ask them about their own aspirations and blend them in, we'll never quite be on the same page. So giving students this choice, which is autonomy in their learning, is what I feel is at the core of a student-first approach. It's also backed by research. Self-determination theory says that there are three key psychological needs for students to feel motivated about what they're doing. And the three are the need for competence, the need for relatedness, and the need for autonomy. And you may have heard or seen presentations about self-determination theory before. You can certainly explore it online to your heart's content. Having autonomy over their learning is vital, especially for teens and adults. Think about how you learn best. If you began learning a new skill set today, would you like having a curriculum set in stone and feel like you're just a cog in a machine and just going, teachers going through the motions? Or would you like to have agency in the direction of your learning and say, yes, I realize that there's a process that I need to go through here and there's going to be techniques I need to learn. But what I really want to be able to do is this and have the teacher be able to guide you towards that. If you're like most adults, you'll probably opt for the latter. And it's why one of the key principles of the assessment for our new certificate of integrated music teaching is that teachers have choices in the focus of their assessment to suit their current circumstances. Clearly, different levels of student first are required at different ages and stages. Adults should have almost total control over what they learn, for maximum motivation and engagement, while six-year-olds should have a curriculum probably mostly determined by a teacher, with some room for choices over pieces and exercises and activities in a similar way to the options you might give a toddler versus a teenager. And there's a whole continuum along that line. And while I say adults should have almost total control over what they learn, of course, I don't mean that to the detriment of any scales, technique, theory, repertoire that you put in front of them. But if they don't have real control over the goals and the content of the lessons, adults will really struggle to stay motivated. Hello, this is Leela Viss longtime friend and fan of Tim, his podcast, and his top music community. I'm pleased to support his groundbreaking efforts. Key Ideas is my podcast, and when you get finished with Tim's latest episode, I invite you to tune into Key Ideas. It's filled with illuminating interviews and transparent reflections. Besides podcasting, I enjoy encouraging musicians to get creative beyond the page and jumpstart their composing skills. Are you interested in nurturing budding composers too? but aren't sure where to begin? If so, it's time to sign up for my 8 plus 8 Composium. It's a four-week online course and limited to eight teachers. Within just a few short weeks, you'll design your own composition eight bars at a time and take away tons of strategies to help your students do the same. Head to leelavis.com, use discount coupon code TOP10 and save on registration. I look forward to meeting you and your creativity. The other element to a student-first approach is to be willing to capture a student's interest and enthusiasm at the very beginning of lessons with fun, creative activities. This is also important when a student might need a boost in their motivation, as so often happens around the tween and teen years, particularly if they've been learning for a few years. If we blithely carry on with business as usual in these circumstances, this is when we can easily start losing students. Now, I read an interesting quote recently, which I want to read out to you, and I want you to think, do you agree with it? The quote is by Edward Maxwell, and it was from an article titled The Basics of Brass, Establishing Secure Technical Foundations from Music Teacher Magazine. And it said this, I was once told by a senior brass teacher during a training day, now, don't worry too much about developing technique or reading music. The most important thing is that students can play a few tunes they can recognize. I profoundly disagreed. Music lessons cost parents a lot of money. If you were paying good money for football coaching, you'd expect your child to be developing specific skills, techniques, and training drills from a professional. Very different from having a kick around in the park with your mates. So, do you agree? Well, I profoundly disagree. Sport and music are actually quite different. 
For the most part, a basic ability to swing a golf club, hit a tennis ball or kick a soccer goal is achievable for most people without much coaching. Sure, refining the technique for all those activities takes years of instruction and practice, but initially, the mechanism is already achievable by most able-bodied people. This means that with very little instruction, most people can enjoy some level of satisfaction at their desired sport and can produce an outcome that's satisfying. Score a goal, get a golf ball into a hole, even if it takes 10 shots, swim 50 metres, dribble a soccer ball. But I think this is where music is different. Students picking up a guitar, violin, trumpet for the first time will not be able to achieve the same sense of satisfaction and it will take quite a few weeks before they'll even be able to make the most rudimentary sounds with a high level of technique. Of course, piano is a little bit different here given that you don't have to worry about intonation and embouchure. But the principle stands. Because of this extended barrier and lengthened barrier to entry, Music has a high rate of attrition at the beginning and it tends to be getting worse, doesn't it? The TikTokification of our children is leading to ever shorter attention spans and most children starting music lessons simply don't know how long it takes to be even moderately good. And so we have students quitting too soon, especially if that focus is on technique as the article was talking about. Now, sure, there will be the 1%, maybe 0.5% of students with 100% committed parents who are happy to focus on perfect technique and performance right from the start without losing interest. But in my experience, these students are in the tiny minority. So, what we need to do in music is, yes, get the basics down. We need to hold the instrument right, sit at the piano correctly if we're playing piano, get the basic arm, hand, bow movements, embouchure correct, just enough to get the sounds happening comfortably. And then, in my opinion, it is good to hook them into lessons and ensure they don't give up too soon. And that is what being student first is all about. Okay, let's talk about pillar number two, multimodal assessment. When you take a student first approach to your teaching, you'll naturally need to reconsider a bit about how you go assessing your students. Put simply, the traditional formal recital might not be the best way to assess and strive towards student progress for all of your students. It may work for lots of them, may work for some of them, it may work for a few of them, but maybe not all of them. And that's okay because recitals aren't necessarily the best assessment strategy. Now, while there's nothing wrong with recitals per se, and I've run hundreds of them in my life and I've performed at them, (laughs) being flexible with which students are required to participate can really increase motivation. If you have students who are mainly working on composing or writing film scores or for whom live performance is a terrifying experience, perhaps there are other ways of assessing them. And so, one of our pillars with the IMT approach is to just be open to other possibilities. So, what other possibilities are there? Well, here are a few I can think of. Um, For students with a pop focus, running a pop showcase form of recital with a live band is a fantastic experience for students. And you can read about that and see videos of that in action on my blog. I did a two or three part series about it. Creating YouTube videos and or their own YouTube channel is hugely popular these days. What kid doesn't want to be a famous YouTuber now? Uh, Also great for student composers or just students who don't really like performing live but would like to have their work presented to the world Um, and YouTube of course is a great way to do that. Our students could build a social media following on Instagram or TikTok using reels to promote their work playing or they could even try teaching whatever their focus is. Um, You could help students to create backing tracks for their repertoire and or compositions uh, that they can play along with at recitals. I've got a whole course on Getting groovy with Garage Band, which explains exactly how to do that step by step. Work towards recording an album. I'll put that in inverted commas. Um, whether or not that ends up online or on Spotify is another matter, but just the task of recording and presenting finished audio files is a great experience for those who are interested in that. And these files could be shared with grandparents or family on USB drives or Dropbox. They could create and present a portfolio. And this is great for students studying a variety of approaches in lessons. Those who are composing, maybe they're talking, they could talk about their arranging work or showcase their shoot music or whatever it is that they've been working on. They could perhaps create a podcast. And maybe if you're running a traditional recital, you could soften the edges a little bit, making it a bit more fun, a bit more accessible. You could make it in the round with performers in the middle of tables of parents rather than on stage. I've seen this done um, a lot 
in studios of our members where parents will bring food and drink and sit at round tables and the instruments in the middle of the room and um, it's much less sort of about them and us and the stage up there. It's all sort of more about the community and the group because we're all together. You can accompany performances with art and visuals and I've recorded podcasts with variety of teachers doing very cool things with recitals and multimedia recitals. You could make it more of a pizza night. Isn't it interesting where, uh, I, this is what I find interesting, is it's oftentimes after the recital finishes and the parents are all talking and you're talking as the teacher to parents and what's going on in the background? Well, the kids are jumping on the piano and playing happily or jamming or just having fun. That's the kind of playing we want to see, right? So, if you take the focus off it being about the recital and more about it being a community event like a pizza night where there's some playing that also happens to happen, maybe that's an option for you. You could also simply remove the need for memorization or make the dress code more casual. There's lots of opportunities there. So, I encourage teachers to really take a flexible and creative approach to assessments of all their students and include students in the decision making around how they can be assessed. And the final pillar, questions build curiosity. Now, ever since I wrote a blog post titled, What I've Learned From Asking More Questions In Music Lessons, I've enjoyed improving my ability to use questions to challenge students and engage them more deeply in critical thinking. Now, in a couple of podcasts, I'm going to be sharing some of my teaching with you on video and audio. And you'll get a sense of just how many questions I ask. It's very rare that I'll dictate too much and I want you to try this as well. Many teachers will have experienced the opposite in their own lessons as a child. Their teachers most likely told them what to do, how to play, how to sit, how to interpret this, what arm movements to make, what facial expressions to make, and they'll correct their mistakes without so much as a second thought. And they probably would have told you how to interpret a music correctly according to their own approach, which would have been learnt from their teacher and so forth. And while there's merit in that, I, I get that there's, there's great merit in some traditional and classical schools of, of thought and approaches, um, it's also great for students to have some say in that. So, in today's modern students, I think we can do much better. By asking more open-ended questions and showing them how we're thinking, we can engage their imagination and creativity and build curiosity. We want, we want them to be thinkers. We want them to be, oh, why, why does that sound like that? And I wonder what happens if I do this and what chord is that? That's really cool. I wonder if I could use that in my own composition. But what if I play this differently? So, my simple mantra is if you can avoid dictating by letting students choose or asking them questions, you're going to be modeling that exploratory curious approach that we want our students to follow. So, for example, here are some questions that you could explore with students. Uh, Number one, how would this sound if you played it louder, softer, higher, more staccato, even if it's not written in the music? Number two, what does that do to the style of the piece? Number three, what are other ways we could interpret this phrase? Let's try all the options. What do you like best? Is that in keeping with the style of this era? Doesn't matter. (laughs) Why doesn't that sound any better than the last play? Were you going too fast, not concentrating? Uh, Number five, what's the most efficient way to practice this scale this week? Put the choice of practice method on them. Number six, you could say something like phrases in music are like speech and song. What happens at the end of sentences when we speak? The the answer would be, you know, the volume decreases and kind of go down. And then you could say, how could we mimic that on piano? Why would we want to mimic that on our instrument? Question seven, why has the composer written two phrases here? Or why does that phrase look similar to that one? Is there something connected about them? What does that show us? If phrases are like sentences, what do we have to do between sentences when we speak so we don't run out of air like I'm running out of air? And how can you show me that on the piano or your instrument? I share lots more examples of these kinds of questions broken up into sections on my blog post about this article, which we'll share in our show notes. Now, remember, you may well know the right answer, right in inverted commas, to a question or the right way to play a phrase, but letting a student come to that conclusion through their own exploration and your questioning will do so much for their own connection to the repertoire. And that's what it means to question for curiosity. So, those are the three pillars that we believe underscores the integrated music teaching learning model. What do you think? 
Which resonates with you? Which do you disagree with? I'd love to find out more. So head over to the show notes for this episode, topmusic.co slash episode 301 and let us know in the comments or find us over on social or send us an email. It'd be great to hear from you. Next week on the podcast, we're going to walk you through the simple three-step process to creating an integrated music teaching lesson. So I can't wait to share that with you next week. Uh, I'm Tim Topham and this is the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast. We'll speak to you next time. How do you keep up to date with all the latest trends and research into music education? How do you connect with other teachers around the world and make sure your teaching stays fresh and relevant for students of all ages and stages both now and into the future? I created our Top Music Pro membership to be the one-stop shop for music teaching resources, training, support and community and I'd love for you to come and join us inside. With over 40 comprehensive training courses, hundreds of teaching demonstrations and lesson plans, free monthly sheet music, discounts and all the business and pedagogy support you could ever need, Top Music Pro is the community you've been looking for. If you're ready to level up your learning from the podcast and join thousands of other teachers in our global network, head over to topmusicpro.com today. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening today. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, visit us at topmusic.co slash podcast or check out the show notes. I'm Tim Topham and this is the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast, a production of Top Music. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy your week ahead and I'll catch you next time.